hear me? Not, and can anybody hear me too well? <laughs> uh, welcome everybody to the um, program. It's gonna get started in just a minute, but while we're waiting for uh, the presentation to come on board, um, I thought it would be a good question to ask. What do you guys wanna learn? Did you have anything in mind uh, when, when you decided to come to this presentation? All right. We can help you with that. We can help you with that a little bit. Which one? Salt cedar. Salt cedar. Oh, Wes knows about that one. But uh, no? You want to know about bugs on salt cedar? Or you want to know about? They kill, they kill the salt cedar. Salt cedar. That's a whole other presentation. I mean, I can cover that, but like, we don't have time. Where are you from? Um, sorry? Okay. We can talk about that. Okay. Yes. Sorry, I'm a plant guy, so I know that. Jolene's an entomologist. In training. Oh, okay. Here we go. Um, so my name is Jolene Tam. I am a Squaxin Island tribal member. I am a graduate student at the University of California, Riverside, and I'm also the Natural Resources Director with the La Jolla Band of Luceno Indians. Um, today, we're going to talk about building a tree pest program, and with me here today, I have Chris McDonald. I'm Chris McDonald. I work with the University of California Cooperative Extension. I do habitat restoration and plant work, so I'm going to cover that in the end, but we have a, a joint five-way, one, two, three, four, five-way presentation today. So we're going to do a lot of musical chairs. Um, do you want to introduce yourself, Wes? Sure. All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Wesley Lewis, Jr. I'm the fire chief for the La Jolla Reservation Fire Department, also a tribal member and uh, descendant from the Epi Nation, San Isabel and uh, Mojave, Fort Mojave. And I'll be presenting part of this myself. Next. Good afternoon, I'm Gian Gonzalez. I'm a program coordinator also with the University of California Cooperative Extension based here in San Diego County. Um, I will be presenting about um, identification of pests. I'm Randall Oliver. I am with UC Agriculture and Natural Resources, specifically with UC IPM. Um, I'm based out of Orange County. And uh, my role is the statewide communications coordinator on invasive shot hole bores. Um, I will primarily be talking about outreach um, without being so specific uh, to that pest. Thank you guys. So over the past few years, I have been working on managing tree pests on the reservation. And a lot of this, what we are sharing with you today is um, derived from that. So if you could turn to the next slide. So forest management planning is um, required by the Code of Federal Regulations, CFR 163 section, or CFR, CFR 25 section 163. Um, forest management planning uh, is required, but not all reservations do it. So the BIA made a regional forest management plan. If you guys see your logo up there, um, go ahead and hit next slide. If you see your logo up there and you've never read this plan, don't worry, most people haven't. So <laughs> this plan was made in 2013 or 14. Um, or no, 2015, but I strongly recommend that um, your reservation make their own forest management plan. Next slide. Um, La Jolla has been working on their forest management plan since 2015 because they didn't want to be on that plan because they weren't asked for their input because that plan was just made to satisfy the law. So they drafted their forest management plan. Um, the foresters did a good job, but because it wasn't tribally led, I think it was lacking. So we've been updating that plan and we're working to get that approved with community input. It's a long process, but hopefully, you know, 10 years later, we'll finally get this plan approved this year. Um, 
If you need a template, you can go ahead and email me at the end and I can send you the base template that um, we use to put our plan together. Um, so part of that forest management plan is managing insects and disease and fire. And the insect and disease management plan is, has several components that you see here. Um, if you go next slide. So I will give this to Wes and he will talk about forest pest management options, the different kinds of options that we can use to manage forest insects. There are a lot of them. So having that, that pre-thought um, pre and planning will help you address issues as they arise. All of that, uh, next slide, I guess, right? Okay, right, this is mine. I thought I was doing fire management. Yeah, here, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so, um, pesticides, uh, but more correctly termed in this uh, phrase, it would be insecticides. Uh, they are preventative for healthy trees. If you spray insecticide on a moderately infested tree, it probably won't do any good. Um, I would only recommend spraying them on healthy trees. Um, they can help tribes meet their forestry goals, um, but they do have environmental costs, we all know that, and they have historically had high impacts to Indian country. Um, so I would recommend that you do a lot of consultation if you decide to implement pesticides. I know we com consulted with the EPA and the CAA DPR and Forest Service and a few other people. Uh, it was it was a long road before we decided to spray insecticides. Um, if you do spray insecticides, you have to check to see if they're working because <laughs> we had a plan and we sprayed insecticides and it it didn't work. It wasn't even working for the moderately infested trees. So we switched to we're only spraying trees that aren't infested at all. But having that monitoring and program in place with insecticides is really important. Um, I think I had two bullet points that had the same thing. <laughs> oh, and you have to monitor the pesticide applicator to make sure that they're doing their job right. You have to read the label law. Um, our applicator wasn't buffering the pesticide tank before he added the pesticides. If you don't buffer the tank, your solution can be spent within two hours. So it was really important that I knew the law and I was watching the applicator and making sure they knew what they were doing and they didn't. But unless you know, you educate yourself and you're there watching them, you would never know. Uh, next slide, please. So when we have invasive insects on the reservation, we have the option to remove the tree. But after we removed a few hundred trees, what are we gonna do with all those that biomass, we have to either chip it or make firewood or make other things like clocks and uh, signs and whatever we can to to build that uh, funding to keep addressing the problem because this problem isn't a one action and then, then done. It's, it's a, recur a recurring problem that's going to be lasting significantly on the La Jolla Reservation for the next 10 years at least. Um, we need to determine when we're gonna remove the tree. Are we gonna remove it when it's dead and it produced all the beetles and insects it possibly can? Or are we gonna remove it when it's starting to die before it can remove, uh, produce the maximum amount of insects to reinfest the adjoining, adjacent trees? Next slide. Um, thinning has historically been done on reservations or in the United States to reduce beetle infestations. Thinning is reducing the trees per acre within a forest. Less trees produce less insects, and the thought is that the infestations will die down quicker with less trees. Um, I don't know if it will work for gold spotted oak borer, but uh, I guess we'll find out one day. Um, pruning is another practice that has been used to address some infestations. It doesn't work for every insect. Every insect has its own um, treatment recommendations. Next slide. 
Uh, we can do cultural or prescribed burning. It's historically been used. Um, we don't know if it works with every pest. Uh, I'll let Wes talk more about fire in the next slide. Uh, or we can choose to do nothing at all. But how much does that cost environmentally and financially? Um, if we would have addressed this problem, we may not have had millions and millions of dollars in losses. I think we've spent over a million and a half dollars addressing this problem. And we got uh, four more million dollars to keep spending money. So it, it's, it's a big problem. Um, and I think a few years ago, I said I needed a uh, 20 million to, to, to address this problem. So I'm a quarter of the way there. Um, but next slide. Um, and so there's a variety of different insects that can cause forest problems. Um, in your planning document, it's always good to have that specific pest management plan for insects that you know are a problem. Um, and that way it's in the plan and the next time that plan gets updated in 20 years that you know, they'll know that this was historically a problem on the reservation when you no longer work there. Hopefully you still live there, but it's good to have that, that documented that it was there because it'll probably come back in the future. Um, there is a GSAB management plan, plan template that the Forest Service created. If you need a template for that management plan, you can go ahead and email me or Jen and we'll try and get that out to you. Next slide. Next section is fire management. Thank you. So cultural burning, and that's something we're working to bring back you know, to the land, to the ground that was taken away from us you know, centuries ago. So that's what we're working towards, especially locally. I know it's been happening, coming back pretty strong in the north country, you know, northern California, which is good. And it's slowly migrating south. And then we're reaching out and working with those folks to do that. Uh, so historical use land management tool, you know, that's exactly historical. And it's been there. It just needs to be brought back, um, and including myself. I've done a lot of burning in my career, 44 years of, of fire and um, still going strong. And this is my, the next 44 years, I'm going to say, maybe. But uh, no, that's where I'm headed. And then I'm, I'm learning as well, because I can put fire in the ground for you, you know, but I've not burned specifically for cultural burning for the grasses and stuff and whatnot. So that's what I'm working towards. Um, uh, technically, it's original prescribed fire. So it reduces insect damage activity before and during harvest. Ash and smoke were historically used to kill insects. And that's what we're going to do with the G-SOB stuff. We want to smoke the trees. Just My reservation burned in 2007. 95% of the reservation burned. Killed major or burned most of our oak trees, majority of our oak trees. 5% that didn't burn, those oak trees are infested with G-SOB. So that's what we're doing. So we're testing that to see if, if that'll hold true. Doing some testing with Jolene with the bug. We're, you know, we're taking logs and stuff and burning it to see, but I think that's key to clue. And then we've been hearing some of that too with some of the folks we've been meeting with, at least smoking the trees for one helps too. And then that heat treatment. Next. Uh, forest fire management. So um, increased tree mortality and fuel loading. Exactly. And that's what we're getting off the reservation where nothing's getting done. Somebody else's property. There's a major accumulation of these dead oaks, acres and acres of dead oaks. 100, 200 year old oaks dying from a little tiny bug or a number of, you know, the, the little bugs, which increases the fire hazard. So on the ground. So now the chance of a, you know, another major wildfire coming through is even greater because now it has the fuel loading for that. Uh, prescribing cultural fire use as a management tool. Exactly. Again, we're going back to that and we can do that because once we clean our yards, right, you got less material on the ground. We just have bigger yards. So it's a lot of work, a lot of funding that has to come about, and but we'll get to it. But you know, we can start at home and work outwards. Fuel break important. Same thing with the fuel break. And that's what I've done most of my burning on is fuel break work for the Forest Service. I retired in, in 2015 from the forest down here, 36 years of all wildland fire, and I've been the fire chief for my reservation since 2000. So, and that's an all risk fire department. So we do just about everything. So 
Next. Was that it? Oh, that was easy. Thank you. So, <laughs> perfect. So the next one, we have funding. Uh, that was a question that came up. So funding can come from a lot of different places. Um, our department is 99% grant funded. Um, I can't read that far away. Uh, you can get funding through the Forest Service and the BIA with 638 contracts. Those are the best ones. Minimal reporting. Um, you can also get uh, funding through NRCS and CAL FIRE. We got a, a really big grant, two and a half million from CAL FIRE from the Tribal Wildfire Resilience Grant. We're really excited to get that. Um, the BLM and Grants.gov also have grants. I've never actually got a grant from the BLM or Grants.gov, but they're on there. Um, you can get funding from wood products. I think last year we got about 5,000 in revenue from firewood production and we use that to purchase our first truck. Um, we're, we got funding from the BIA to make signs. We're gonna make wood signs. We need, we need a way to get rid of this biomass and bring funding for the things that the grants don't like to cover. Um, I made a clock with a piece of firewood, it's beautiful. Uh, there's sky's the limit. You just got to be creative with your funding. Um, I've also been thinking about uh, planting more elderberry and sage and, and yucca, those interstitial plants that grow outside the woodlands and in between uh, the, the fields with grass. I think they're called meadows. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but to, to put more diversity of plants in the forest brings more animals, more people that more, that you're increasing the stewardship of those lands and developing that relationship with the forest that, that is needed to keep it healthy. Um, I want to try to pitch eventually when things get better, uh, getting a recreational tax to start taking a portion of that, that, that tourism to fund the, the tree programs because we have to go in and limb the trees that get mistletoe so we keep everybody safe when they're camping. It's really important that we build that long-term funding into our program to be self-sustaining because grants come and go, but we want our jobs to be permanent. Um, charging for people to visit in a cultural interpretive eco garden that could be another source of funding people want to learn they want to get out in their in the environment with their kids so they can teach them um, there's so many opportunities for funding that live outside grants but um, grants are pretty easy but they're stressful a lot of reporting they're no fun <laughs> uh, next slide um, our next section we have monitoring what are we looking for when we're in the woods? How do we know what to look for? There are so many different types of insects. We have um, the gypsy moth. I'm sorry. I think it's called spongy moth. Spongy moth. <laughs> um, uh, emerald ash borer, the Asian long, -horned, long horned beetle. Yeah. The shot hole borer beetle, the western oak borer beetle. Um, Gold spotted oak borer beetle. Then we have the palm weevil. Uh, that's probably going to wreck, wreck havoc on the date farms up in um, north of us. Uh, there's there's a lot of things to be aware. So in that forest management planning, we want to identify those res primary resources concerns and then find out what insects threaten those resources. Um, next slide, please. Um, after we determine which trees are important resources to protect, we want to monitor those trees because insects are so small. Can you pass around my, my uh, tea there? Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, insects are so small. I've never seen a gold spotted oak borer in the forest. I pull them out as larvae from within the trees or I catch them in rearing bins, but I've never seen one out under a tree. They're very small and they don't play all day. <laughs> um, so the chances of act as actually seeing an insect are kind of rare. So we want to monitor those trees for uh, leaf loss. If an oak tree that has leaves all year starts to lose its leaves and you see the branches sticking up the top of the tree, there's probably something wrong with it. 
if the tree starts bleeding or has a whole bunch of holes in it, um, in the bark, uh, there's probably something wrong with it. So number one, we're looking for damage um, on specific kinds of trees that we want to protect. Um, when we go out looking for damage and monitoring those trees, we have to decide how many trees we're going to inspect because it is time consuming. Um, we're going to decide what areas we want to be looking for insect damage in. Um, and then we have to decide how we're going to record those health survey assessments so we can keep that track record of what we did because I can't even remember last week. So it's good to have that record. Um, if your, serve, your monitoring program is working or you need to change it and what was done. Next slide. And trapping. Uh, some people use traps like the state of California food and ag loves traps. Traps are effective. Um, you can set the traps out. If your insect of concern is attracted to a certain smell, you can bait your traps. Um, they have a different type of trap for every insect almost. Some can use the same traps, but most have either a different bait or a different type of trap. But if you decide to trap who's going to identify your insects, you can do field training. I worked with the CDFA for three months and they field trained me to spot, spot check for six different types of insects. It's not that hard, but most people see a bug and they all look the same. <laughs> and I, I can relate to that because they're all small and they're black and you got to look really close. Um, but it's, it's not something everybody wants to do. So yes, you can trap, but it, you got to plan out how and who and you have to check your traps every two to four weeks. If you get too many bugs, it's really hard to look through to see if your insect of concern is there. Um, let's see, yeah, who will identify the insects, I talked about that. And if you do find that insect of concern, what are you gonna do? Um, if you don't have that funding, what can you do? So having that forest management plan helps you identify your, the weaknesses to your action plan. Next slide. And our outreach. So outreach is really critical to a forest management, pest management plan. Um, Wes talked about what happens when you're doing a good job controlling it in your particular area, but just down the street, just down the hill from where you are, you've got people that aren't doing anything. And so this can even happen within your own community where you've identified a problem, but you can't get the people that live in your community to take any action on it. They don't wanna look at the trees that are surrounding their own homes. Um, they don't wanna participate in a program to help eliminate this because they don't understand the magnitude of the problem. So outreach can help you to actually accomplish the goals of your program and recruit people and engage people to help you execute that program. And that can happen within your local community, um, beyond the specific borders of your community, and even to a much greater extent across the state, across the region. Um, because these pests, as Jolene talked about, are spreading. We don't know what's coming next. Um, we have to be alert to various pests and we need to take actions that can help to stop the spread of these pests. So what can we do to help build that knowledge and help build engagement on these programs? Well, one thing we can do is exactly what this team is doing here today and that's making presentations. So we're here at this conference. We're talking about the, the, the pest management program. Um, we go to various conferences throughout the state, uh, participating with other agencies, whether it's CAL FIRE or um, US Forest Service or the agricultural commissioners, and make presentations um, in person. 
Um, we also conduct webinars. Um, uh, you'll actually, if you uh, go to the University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources um, website, you can find uh, web uh, presentations on a variety of pests, on a variety of, of uh, plant uh, weed uh, disease issues. Um, so this is a, a great way uh, to uh, engage people outside of, of your um, close quarters. Um, also, uh, newsletters, um, blogs, social media. So here I'm talking about more electronic types of communications, um, uh, electronic newsletters. Um, it's very helpful uh, if you have a website um, for your tribe or for your community. Um, that you can um, provide information on. Um, and there is a lot of information available through a variety of sources. Um, again, being the Forest Service, uh, um, the uh, California Department of Food and Agriculture, uh, UC Agriculture and Natural Resources, um, a wealth of materials that um, people like us would love to share um, and uh, we can provide those things in digital format. Um, if uh, you want to put those in your newsletters, et cetera. Um, materials that can be handed out are very uh, helpful as well, help to spread the message. Um, you can each get one of these fly swatters. Um, this is something that was done as part of a, a program called Buy It Where You Burn It. It's the don't pack a pest message. And the reason that we create things like this that people take home with them is it has a message right on there that they're gonna be out there swatting those flies and, oh wait, what does that say? Okay, buy it where you burn it. I don't know if you've heard that message before, but this is a, something that relates to firewood, which is one of the big messages that um, I share uh, when I go out to conferences or community events, et cetera. Um, basically, a lot of these pests that we're talking about can be spread in on firewood. A lot of the discussion today has been about gold spotted oak borer. It's here in Southern California. It's gradually moving northward and eastward. Um, well, how did it get here? It's not native here. It's native to southeastern Arizona um, and also uh, adjoining areas of Mexico. Somehow it crossed the desert. It cannot fly very far. So how did it manage to get across this vast desert to San Diego um, and start infesting the oak trees here? The answer is firewood. Um, you could move a piece of infested firewood, not, not knowing that it's infested. Um, the uh, gold-spotted oak borer could live in the firewood for up to two years after that wood is down on the ground. So there's a whole bunch of protocols. I think somebody may be talking about that later on here about um, how you um, try to control that wood. And I think Jolene talked about chipping, for example, and some of the other things you can do with that, but debarking and um, a lot of these types of things. But um, these types of things really help to enforce that message in a very simple way that people can understand. So we create these. We've got tattoos over here um, that uh, the kids love those. Stickers. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> you should all be sure to get one of those before you leave today. Um, but um, these things are very helpful um, for sharing the message and, and communicating why these things are um, such a concern. Um, media is another thing. So when I'm talking about media, I'm talking about things like newspapers, magazines, broadcast news. Um, lots of those types of things, you know, you kind of think, well, it's unapproachable. I'm not, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not somebody that can write something or um, tell this story. Um, but most of these news outlets are desperate for news. They, they would love to hear the story about this. So um, don't be afraid um, to go out and look for those kinds of opportunities. 
And again, um, you've got a lot of allies as you're building out these programs um, with uh, UC Agriculture and Natural Resources, um, with your um, local ag commissioner's offices. Um, we've got a lot of people that are more than happy uh, to help you um, write articles or um, share the information specific to your area and then help to, to um, position that uh, with the uh, publication. Next slide. Um, and, and the big thing is spread the word, don't spread the past, but spread the word. Um, there's lots of ways to do that in your local community. Um, we all participate in a lot of tribal and community events. Um, you can go online. Again, it's really helpful if you have a, a website and an online presence of some sort in your community. Um, if you don't have that, fairly simple um, to uh, establish something like that, um, specific to your um, pest or forest management program um, in the community, in uh, campgrounds, um, other uh, strategic locations, even the grocery store, uh, information boards. Um, you can get a flyer, put that up there on the board. Um, you can customize that uh, to your local area. And signage is the same thing. You know, you can um, put that wherever you're gonna have uh, the most impact. And I think the biggest thing about outreach that I would add here is that uh, it's not a one size fits all program. You know, you've got assets in your own community that um, you can best utilize to tell your story. So customize your program, um, which with whatever um, particular assets and resources that you have, and do reach out to all those allies because there's a lot of us out there that are ready and willing to help you in any way we can. Next slide. Research. Thank you. And I would add that having outreach in your grants makes them look really good and it's, it's really easy to do. So you just call Randall or Jan or Chris and say, come on out. You can check your box off. <laughs> I, I did forget to mention that the NRCS has funding. So Cody right there, he can help you ask him for money. <laughs> no problem. So research. Research is also a very important part of your pest management program. For GSAB in particular, there were no there were no guidelines that really helped us. So we set out to answer those questions because we didn't know. We wanted to find the answers to address a landscape of infested trees. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the GSOB research is community guided. Before I set foot on the reservation and I think the day that I met Wes, I just, my, my brain exploded because um, I, his red truck, I started thinking fire and then I was learning all about GSOB. And then it, it just made sense. So um, it's really important that it stems from the community. The community needed those answers. Um, a, a lot of people wanted to use fire. It, it had been thought about for a long time. So having that research to back up what the community already knows is really important. Um, next. And then uh, research can be tribally led or it can be universally university led. Um, but if it is university led, just make sure that um, in your contract with the university, you build up the opportunity for the youth to work with those researchers so that they get their training and they get exposure to researchers and to schools and to other things. So just make sure that your research plan is really benefiting your tribe. Next slide. Um, so within the research that we're doing on the La Jolla Reservation, we did a pile burn experiment. It was really fun. We cut down some infested wood and we put it in a pile, we burned it, um, Andrew filmed it, it's pretty cool. Uh, then we put that infested wood in boxes next to some infested wood that wasn't burned in boxes. And I found out that um, the pile burn reduced the gold spotted oak borer emergence by 98%. That's like huge if you're doing um, a sanitation implementation and you're cutting down all this infested wood you don't want to move it because it's going to have bugs coming out of it. So you, you stack your cut trees 
make sure everything is burned around them. And that's really going to reduce the insects coming out and spreading and infecting nearby trees. Next slide. Uh, we also did heat treatment experiments. We wanted to find that temperature that firewood can be heated to where the bug can no longer come out. Uh, we found that um, heating the wood till the internal temperature hit 60 degrees for 60 minutes looks to be really effective. I still need to do my statistical analysis and make sure I did it all right, but hopefully we'll be able to say that for certain next June. Um, next slide. Um, and I took one class in um, parasitoid wasps, and I found a wasp on the reservation that's never been found before in California. So um, I got another lab, um, the Heredity Lab, and uh, a few undergrad students, Ryan Campos. He did the DNA analysis on this and verified that the same wasp is the same parasitoid of emerald ash borer on the East Coast. So it moved all the, across the country by itself, which is kind of cool. But having that, that research um, network was really cool to be able to find new potential biological control agents for your pest of concern and to be able to test that out and, and figure out if that's going to work for your problem in particular. Next slide. Oh, good. <laughs> Next section. Uh, identification. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Jolene. Um, so I'm going to be talking about identification, basically how to answer what's this bug, if that's your question. Um, and I know, excuse me, um, we're not all from California here, um, and there may be different pests that um, you're trying to manage. So um, I'll try to talk in more general terms. But the first question is why is this needed? And also address who to contact, where you can go to get assistance, and then how to ask. Um, what information do you need to have ready? Next slide, please. So first is to really understand why you're even gonna be asking the question. Is it just because you wanna know what's killing your tree in your backyard or what that little hole in the, you know, just for your personal information or, um, are you going to be using this for developing a plan, a planning document or some kind of management plan document? And the reason I bring this up is because the more you realize what it is you're going to be uh, at the onset, what you're going to be trying to build from answering that question about the pest, um, then the more information you'll know to gather or questions to ask when you reach out to people or look into resources. Next slide, please. So, um, where and or who are the resources? There's, like Randall mentioned, there's all sorts of um, a variety of types of resources, um, in person people to contact, specialist researchers, as well as um, online or digital tools that you can use to help identify the pest, um, print materials, um, field guides. I, I have several examples here that you can come look at after the meeting of different field guides, um, depending on if it's spe pest specific or um, type of tree, like this is on oak woodlands, all sorts of pests and diseases. Um, so there's lots of materials out there. If you, kind, if you realize, if you know that there's a pest that's been threatening in your general area, you can start there and, and get the resources that are available there to help see if that's what's attacking your trees. Um, if you're just really, just I don't know what this is. This is just something out of the blue. There's online tools or digital tools such as iNaturalist. I don't know who, if you might be familiar with that. It's an app that you can use and you can take pictures and it's a, a, just a community of online users that help you identify situations. You can also reach out to um, Cooperative Extension or the universities in your area. Um, they might have natural resource specialists or um, others who are doing research in that area and may be able to help you. Um, the Ag Commissioner's Office in the county local to you um, might have a lab or a pathology lab or um, an entomology lab and folks there that can help you. Um, your state that you're in, state parks or other agencies, um, um, certainly the Forest Service 
in your area, and, um, other federal agencies, natural resource conservation. Um, so think of, you know, there's federal, state, and then local county area, as well as just your general tribal community area resources too. If there's other tribes nearby or other community groups, um, I mean, conferences like here, a huge network here. Um, I know Chris leads uh, a monthly network just here in, in San Diego, Southern California area. So think of other networks that you might be able to tap into to ask the questions and find experts that maybe can help you in identifying this best. Um, but lots of lots of different resources that you can check. And then there's always the private industry, um, local arborists or labs, um, private labs that you might be able to contact to find information. Next slide. So um, determine where you're gonna go. If you wanna send a sample in, where are you sending it to? So if it's, if it's say, the Ag Commissioner's Office, or if it's your statewide agriculture um, or forestry lab, um, go online and find out what are the specifics um, that are required for the lab. What information are they going to need? So there's typically a form you need to fill out and information that you need to use for labeling your, your sample. Um, you'll want to really follow those instructions so that they can process your sample. And you want to make sure that you're collecting and sending it in correctly so that you don't risk damaging the sample before they can get to it, and then they can respond to you too as well. So things that you want to make sure that you do is um, if they want if they want an actual tissue and you're using a knife or a chisel to cut it out, you want to really want to make sure that your tools are sanitized and clean when you do that and follow those best management practices. Um, depending on what it is you're collecting, again, if it's a whole branch or is it just a small insect if you are able to find an insect um, or is it just um, infested tissue that you're cutting, uh, like a piece of bark or is it leaves? Um, you know, there's, you can use like Ziploc plastic bags sometimes. There's uh, sometimes other little small vials you can use. Insects can be um, held suspended with like hand sanitizer um, just for the moment while you're collecting and, and then use with paper towel. Every, every site or lab is going to have specific instructions on what information they're going to want from you and how they want you to collect samples. Um, again, if you kind of know, suspect what the insect might be, um, sometimes those pest programs, education outreach programs, will have specific information and hand out information about that on how to take a sample or how to monitor and survey, how to set up a sticky trap if that's what you're using, or how to set up a funnel trap if that's what you're using to collect your samples. For instance, I know the shot hole bore um, program has um, handout materials on that specifically. Um, a lot of times, identifications can be made through photographs that you submit. And I know both Gold Spot at Oak Bore and Shot Hole Bore um, have systems where you can upload photos, and specialists will look at those photos and typically be able to identify. If not, and if they suspect that there may be a new infestation in an area, um, we all work with a huge host series of network of um, people who are working in this, in that certain pest threat programming and will typically contact you and come out to, to help you look directly at it. But you want to be really good when you submit your photos. So you don't want them blurry. Um, you need to know how many photos do they want in their submission. Typically it's around three to four. Um, you want to, I would say, take a picture of the entire tree Take a picture of um, the tree in, in the broader landscape. So if, if someone does go out to inspect it in person, they can find that tree in conjunction with any other areas. Um, up close to the insect, the evidence of infestation, so any symptoms. So if there's um, woodpecker damage or um, you see the actual exit holes. If you're taking a picture of an exit hole, like the picture on the screen shows, we recommend you put a, a pin or something up next to the hole for scale. Um, if um, it's damaged leaves, take a picture close up of the picture of the leaves or the bark. Again, if you kind of suspect what pest it might be um, based on just the symptoms, uh, there's specific photos that are going to be requested for that pest. 
Um, if it's just in general, just think in those terms. You want to show the person the injury or the symptom, the evidence of why you think there's a problem. Um, the larger tree, the tree in the larger area, if the crown is thinning, if it's got leaves like Jolene mentioned, and all of a sudden there's less leaves, take a picture of the crown. Um, those are the types of pictures that people are looking for. And again, not blurry. That's, that tends to be a problem that we see, very blurry pictures. So we want good quality pictures. Um, next slide. I think that's it. Again, we want to invite you to um, come and get any of these handouts we have here. And then if you want to come and look at some of these, um, I just brought a couple of guides. You can look at that. And then I did want to mention real quick, they mentioned education outreach, really reach out to your community, help you with that. This is someone in our the Julian community who was talented in creating jewelry or casting this. And this was a huge fundraiser for the community to help support their um, management efforts in that area. So really think outside of the box when it comes to that. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Next slide. Five minutes, four minutes probably. Okay. Um, so restoration on the restorationist. Um, Restoration is the last thing you do, but it's probably the second thing you think about. And I'll cover this super fast. Um, but so what we just did right now is basically like a, a six hour workshop of what you just had. So you got the super crash course of fun. Or you, you found a dead tree. Who do you reach out to? What's killing this tree? How do you figure that out? How do you engage the community? How do you use fly swatters to, and tattoos to get kids involved? Um, and Randall's right, like those things like go off of our table way more than the technical guides, which is great. Um, and so you've gone through, did I say funding already? Funding, you've got experts involved. You might have somebody awesome like Jolene coming in and helping do with research. And so now you've got hopefully not, but you might have many dead trees and you need to figure out what to do with that space. And so that's where somebody like me comes in. And so uh, next slide. So uh, wait, no, no, before I go back one slide, sorry, I'm too fast. Um, I only got like three minutes left. Okay. Um, so what you really need to thinking about with restoration is what species you want to have on site. Are you going to plant the same thing that's dying? In some cases, yes. In Southern California, oaks are extremely important. And so we do not want to lose oaks from the landscape, even though the gold spotted oak borer is killing oaks. So the goal is we're going to plant some oaks and in 20 years, somebody might have a solution to not have those trees be dead trees. Right now, they might be dead in 20 years, they might not, but we're really looking to be positive. But if you have something like pine beetles, then maybe you don't wanna plant a bunch of pine trees, maybe you're gonna think of something else. Um, at what density are you planting a forest, something thin? Um, the weeds, the weeds are almost always going to kill your tree seedlings. You have to be thinking about weeds when you're planting, and that's great for doing community events, things like that. There's a boatload of techniques, I'll go over them really quick, and assistance. Okay, next slide. Um, I talked about which species to plant. The other thing that is really important is what species are missing from your landscape? Is there something going wrong with the fire regime? Is there something going wrong with, with um, traditional management practices where something used to be abundant 100, 200 years ago and that species is not on your landscape? This is a time for you to use that crisis of losing these trees to think about what you want your forest to look like for you, your children, and your grandchildren. Um, next slide. Density, I think that makes sense. Think something's going to kill your tree. So when you're thinking about density, you're also thinking about how many things are going to kill your tree seedlings and how much you need to overstock. So that way, as the deer browse your oaks and you lose 40% of your oaks or 20% of your oaks, whatever the magic number is, you have the right number of oaks at the end of the project. Next slide. I do a lot of work on weeds. The weeds are vulnerable. Okay. I'm not out of time, right? Yes. Okay. The weeds are going to kill your tree seedlings. Your tree seedlings are this big. Your weeds are this big. It's just, I don't know. For me, it just kind of makes sense. I'll, I'll turn on my, my big boy voice here. <laughs> um, so, so again, like 
can can you kill the weeds now and can you kill the weeds next year and can you kill the weeds after that so finally those trees turn into to little big children and then they turn into teenagers and those teenagers can go fly off on their own and survive next one um Okay, so techniques. There's a lot of different techniques out there. I don't have time to get into this. This is another whole hour lecture condensed into one slide. But the main points are you can spend a lot of money or you can spend a little bit of money depending on what your budget is, like using volunteers, relatively cheap. All they really need are water and good snacks um, versus getting professionals. They require getting paid. Um, next slide. There's a lot of assistance out there to help you. We talked about Cody with NRCS. They have a table just on the other side of that wall. Go talk to them. I work for Cooperative Extension. There's a Cooperative Extension office in nearly every single county in the US. Um, reach out to them. Uh, resource conservation districts, all the federal land management, and your state and local city, county parks. There's probably somebody near you who, who also is working with the issue of dead trees that you can rely on their help on. Next slide. All right, and so Jolene is gonna take us home. We got two slides left. So our take home messages that we learned today are the uh, forest and pest management plans, identify the consensus of tribal goals and threats, and they identify those potential actions that the tribe has approved taking. Um, second, unmanaged forest pests can devastate cultural resources and cause millions of dollars in damages, so we need to be aware of them. Third, forest management includes tree removal, thinning, limbing, insecticides, and cultural and prescribed fire use. Uh, fourth, no application or product is 100% effective for all situations. Every tribe is different, and so is every bug. Um, last, Identification, monitoring, outreach, and restoration are all essential to a tree pest management plan. And I forgot coordination with the fire folks. They're really important. Um, and any, do we have time for questions or do we have to? Yeah, okay. If you have questions, uh, take a picture of our email, email us. We love emails, right? I forgot to say the wood samples. Are ours that need to come back to us, because everything else is yours. So if you have a piece of wood, please, I'll, I'll collect it or put it somewhere where we get. Thank you. 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 Thank you.